thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar, our first one of the new year. Um, we're super excited to have one of our own here to present to you all. So I will turn it over to Kathy Bodine. Hi, thank you. I'm excited to be here. It's been a while since I've gotten to provide a talk for SWAC. So I'm really excited to be here and see you guys again. Um, so what the team asked me to do is talk about grant writing. And so it's interesting um, when I think back, I, I have no idea how many of you have um, written a grant, how many of you have been successful, how many of you have struggled. Um, I really don't know. But what I am going to do today is take us back to the very beginning of learning how to write a grant and the things, the tips and tricks that you really need to be successful. Um, so I called it Grant Writing 101. And, um, and so, come on. There we go. Before I get started, um, we have a new picture. I haven't gotten updated yet um, or haven't uploaded yet, but I always wanted to give a shout out to my team. Many of them you know, uh, some of them you may not, but we have an incredible team of roughly 30 people who spend their working hours thinking about assistive technology, disability, or aging into disability from all um from all the different components and variations of what we do. And if it wasn't for them, I would not be here today. So sometimes I get the credit when they do the work and I always wanna make sure that they get some credit and recognition for all they do to make our team so successful. So what are we gonna to do today? We're gonna to talk about, first of all, how to develop a fundable idea. We're gonna talk about what are the main parts of a grant. We're gonna kind of create a plan of action and have you start to think about writing a grant. Um, I want mo perhaps one of the most important things I can do is talk to you about how grants are reviewed and the perspective of grant reviewers, because that's really critical, because those are the people who decide if you get the money or not. Right. So you really want to think about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about some sources of grant support. OK, so that's what I have on the agenda for today. Um, and I always like to um, think about a lot of decision points before you even begin to write a grant. And so my cartoon is uh, a guy who's saying he's, he wants to find out once and for all whether there's any truth in the belief that money can't buy happiness. Um, and so if you've ever tried to get funding for a project that you really care about, you know that yeah, sometimes it can make you a little bit happy to, to have that extra money in your back pocket so you can do what you want to do. Okay, so in your handouts that I think Catherine sent out to you, there is something that um, is called uh, My Big Idea in your um, handout. Do you see that on my slide now? The the sheet that's showing up. Can somebody yes. let me know if you see that? Okay. All right. So what I want you to do before we get started, I don't think you'd be here if you didn't have an interest in, in figuring out how to get some additional funding coming in for your program or for something specific that you have in mind. So what I want you to do is to say, if I had X amount of money, I would, and I want you to write that down. Okay. And I'm going to give you a minute or so to do that. Okay, so has everybody figured it out? Why do you think, just out of curiosity, and if somebody wants to hop in with this answer, why do you think I would ask you to put in a dollar amount up front and then you what you would do? Why do you think I would ask that? Anybody have an idea? I don't see any talkers. Oh, there's a screen scare. No idea. Okay. Well, let me tell you why I would do that. 
the thing about grant writing and then help focus the search for funding, maybe you need a goal. Excellent, excellent. The reason I wanted you to do that is because I personally can't tell you how many thousands of meetings I've been in in my career where we've sat around and said, wow, I'd really like to do X. You know, I really want to do this. I really want to get get this room um, to have all these adaptations in my room so that I can do this. Or I'd really like to get this piece of equipment or I really wish I had money for this program. But unless and until we put some concrete facts together, you'll never get the money. It's really important to understand what you want to do and how much it's going to cost. And we're going to talk a little bit more about budgets um, as we go through this. Um, but when you write a grant, and I'm going to go over here to my handout, there's some questions you have to really ask yourself. Okay. And the, the first question is, does this project address an important problem or critical need or barrier to progress in the field? Yes or no? So if you're just saying, oh, I'd like to have some extra money because it'd be really cool if we had this in our classroom, is it addressing a critical barrier? Is your support for your students stopped because you don't have this? What's the deal? And then why or why not? You have to be able to answer these fundamental questions before you even start to write a grant. It's really important. And this will make a little bit more sense as we go through. And we say if the aims, you might say if the objectives, aims and objectives are fairly similar, are achieved, how will scientific knowledge, technical capability, the community, lives, and or you could say educational or clinical practice be improved? What's the impact if you're addressing this barrier and you're successful, what is the impact gonna be? Is the impact only in your classroom? Is it an impact that maybe could go to other districts? Is it an impact that could go statewide or national? I don't know, but you have to know what change or impact you're gonna have in order to write a grant. And this will make more sense again as we go along. And then, how will successful completion of the project change the concepts, attitudes, methods, technologies, treatments, services, or interventions that drive your field or your, your space? Okay, so you're looking at what is the impact? How is it going to make things better first? And then what is the change process that's built into this? You know, just just wanting money because you want to do something you think would be cool is the first place to start, of course. But until you can answer these questions and write about these answers within your application, you're going to have a really hard time getting funding. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And so the first thing that I always do, and these are the things... Um, the, the grants I've written, the things that I've done over the years, these are the fundamental questions that I always talk about when we have like a team meeting to discuss a pro proposal or a project. We sit down and we ask these questions and we talk these things through. Um, and the reason for that is funding agencies, it's a lot easier to say no than it is to say yes. And the reason for that is when you get money, whether it's from a foundation, a state, federal grant, wherever the money comes from, they're investing in you. Yeah. That's their organization's reputation. It's their um, mission, their vision for whatever it is that they are supporting. And they need to know that if you do this and they give you this money, that you're going to pay them back by having an impact and by making, even if it's incremental change, but making an important change within the area of what you're doing. Okay. 
So it's always really important to have these things in your mind before you start. And I will tell you that from my side of the fence, um, by doing this and really being thoughtful about it, myself personally, I've brought in over $39 million in grants. My team altogether between grants and projects has brought in over $70 million. So we take this very seriously because we've learned over the years that you're going to get rejected. It's, it's so much easier to be rejected, right? And so we don't want that. We want to get funding because we want to do with this cool project, whatever that is. So what I want to move on to now, so we've, we've um, talked about our questions. So let me get this back up. Can you guys see the screen again? Yes. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about RFPs. And an RFP is a request for proposal. And they come in many forms. And we're going to look at one in just a bit. And the if you're not anal retentive, get somebody on the writing team that is. Because the very first thing you need to do is read the request for proposals carefully very, very carefully. And what I do when I get it, when I decide that I want to look at a request for proposals, I literally pull it up on my screen and I get the, you know, the, the yellow highlighter and I go through that RFP line by line by line. And I highlight all of the requirements or anything within that request for proposal that is going to help me write a better grant. And I make sure that I'm addressing their concerns. So um, uh, like the Paralyzed Veterans uh, Association, it's a foundation that gives out like $50,000, $100,000 grants. And right away, Paralyzed Veterans Association, right? So you're dealing with veterans, you're dealing with paralysis, and does my project fit their mission and vision? Because if it doesn't, you're not going to get the money. That's just the bottom line. And so you want to make sure that there's this good fit for you. And we'll talk about resources as we get closer to the end. But the next thing that is in your handout, one of your handouts is a Colorado Common Grant application. Um, and this is um, it's kind of interesting, really. But a number of years ago, um, the a number of Colorado foundations got together because they all had different RFPs. And so anybody applying for money from them had to learn each individual agency's RFP. So they said, what if we had a common grant application that people could use and learn to use and it could be accepted at a variety of foundations. And so that's still in play today um, for a number of foundations in Colorado. So it's something you might look at, do they accept the common grant application? And if they do, then you already have it in your hand. But it, what I like about it is it starts out with a checklist. And these checklists, if, the, if a grant RFP does not have a checklist, I make one right away. Because if you don't check every single box of every single document they're asking for, they can arbitrarily reject your proposal. And I will give you a great example. And back many, many years ago, when I first came to see you, I had this boss whose name shall remain anonymous. And I was getting ready to submit a grant. And at the time, my husband had a, a work party that we needed to go to. And this person told me they would take my grant. This was back when you mailed them in and they had to be at the post office before midnight. She promised to mail my grant and get it in on time. And I walked away. She got it to the post office at 12.03 a.m. Because there's a downtown Denver post office that was open till midnight. And my entire proposal got rejected. And it was for like $1.6 million. It didn't even get reviewed because I didn't get it in on time. Never forgotten that, <laughs> right? Um, so if you miss anything they're asking you for, you will not be reviewed and your grant will not be even thought about. So all that work you've done is for naught. So what you want to do is look at what is on 
um, what is within the RFP. And in this case, as I said, they've given you a checklist. So before you submit it, the very last thing you do is make sure um, you've got everything in. Okay, so the first thing you do is verify and check if they accept the Colorado Common Grant application and if there's any modifications they've made. So one foundation may have said, oh, we only see, we only serve populations of people who are between the ages of 18 and 54 or something like that. Whatever it is, you wanna know so that you've got modifications or maybe they ask for an additional document. You wanna make sure you check. And then you wanna make sure you've complied with any of those unique application requirements. And then many grants, not all, but many require a cover letter. And the cover letter is pretty much dear foundation, I, uh, attached you will find a submission for this uh, proposal with the following team and we feel really highly qualified to do this, you know, whatever uh, information you wanna put in that. Um, and you make sure you give a brief description of how the request fits with the mission and their priorities. Okay, so if you're sin submitting something to the Paralyzed Veterans Association, the uh, request fits because the population of interest are paralyzed veterans, and this is about a wheelchair thing, so that's really important to mobility is really important for their mission, um, et cetera, et cetera, and this will improve the lives, the quality of life or whatever it is that their mission says. Um, because you want to make sure if you're, they'll boot your proposal if you don't have those things in there. So it's very important that you've really done these things. And then there is a two page template for a summary sheet form. We can see that in a bit. And then the narrative. And the narrative is the most important part of any grant at the end of the day, because that's where you're outlining your program or your project, whatever it is that you want to do. So, for example, one of the things that you want to look for is formatting. Um, and I'll give a good example. The Administration on Community Living, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDLER, we submit a fair number of grants there to that organization. They're the only funding agency that requires that you double space and have one inch margins in your document. So if you send in a single spaced project, they kick it out. And one at one time for several years, even your tables had to be double spaced. And so it made the tables really awkward. And, you know, it was hard to understand the tables because of that formatting, but that was a requirement. If you didn't do that, they did not review your grant. So formatting is a big deal. Um, so you want to make sure you understand what they say. And then the next limit, and we're going to go through these things again um, in some of our slides, but the next thing you look at is um, the page limits. If you go over by even one line, they do not have to read your grant. Okay, so the reason I'm pointing all of this out is because these are avoidable mistakes, correct? These are things that if you're paying attention are not going to stop your proposal from being reviewed. You don't pay attention, it will stop your proposal from being reviewed. So it's very important. So in this one, they have two kinds of grants. There's a general operating uh, request, and that tends to be like Meals on Wheels, where they need money to provide meals, for example. And then program or project request, which would be most likely what most of us do. Um, and you see there's a five page limit and you're supposed to answer questions one through four, five, six, whatever, you know, so it tells you exactly what to do. And then here are the narrative questions. So if you're doing one through four, you got to have your organizational background, your goals, your programs, etc. So I'm not going to beat a dead horse horse with this, but I wanted you to really get a chance to um, hear how important this stuff is as we're talking about it. And then there's the lovely attachments. There are attachments that they will or will not allow. And attachments usually include your resumes, your um, budgets, you know, all of those types of things. And each granting agency has their own list of allowable attachments. Do not attach anything that they don't ask for because that can, again, get your grant thrown out. Um, and so you want to be very careful and thoughtful to make sure you get all of the different types of attachments that they're asking for. And then there are um, 
if there are um, organiz you don't have to worry about this for the fiscal agent if you're working within a school system. And then this is their summary sheet form. Okay, so I'm going to stop at that. But what I would really encourage you to do um, is to make sure that you you read this common. Colorado Common Application, because that will give you a baseline for any other proposal that you're ever going to write, even if it's a research grant for the federal government. This gives you a, a good familiarity with what you want to think about. And um, it's so important to organize your proposal so that it matches what the RFP is asking for in the same order. So, for example, for National Institutes of Health, the standing review panels um, they literally will go through and look to see if you've hit every section. And if you haven't, they throw it out. So um, it's important to pay attention, very deep attention to that. And so what I'm really saying, the summary is never, ever, ever think outside of the box. It's, you know... A lot of people, and I've seen this as a grant reviewer, I've done a lot of grant reviewing in my time, and um, somebody will think, oh, I can just make it prettier if I add these photographs. And if they say, do not put photographs in your grant, that's enough to get it kicked out, right? So when you write a grant, it is the most proscribed writing you will ever do. Um, and it's really an art form to get everything you want to say within this structure that they've provided to you, okay? So let's move on. So let's talk about general tips and tricks with grant writing. Um, ah, excuse me, my computer cable just fell. Okay, so every grant that gets reviewed, no matter where it's from or who it's for, has some kind of point system attached to it. In other words, you get points for what you do. And so in um, most grants, particularly foundation grants, they may say, okay, a grant is worth a hundred points. So um, the narrative may be worth 50 points and all those little things we talked about, the budget, et cetera, will have some point allocation. And what we tend to do is we look really deeply at how they're going to score the grant, how they're going to review the grant. And we want to make sure that we're, we're beefing up those sections that are going to give you more points so that you really pay attention to the point allocation. Um, most funding agencies have a what we call a cutoff line. And if you're above the line, in other words, you score high enough, you get the money. If you're below the line, you're not going to get the money, right? You're going to get rejected. So what you want to do is look um, very closely at how they're going to score your proposal. And if they don't tell you um, in the documentation, um, you can always reach out to the agency that you're interested in and ask to speak to a project officer for grants. And in that phone call, there are a number of things you can accomplish. Number one, you can make sure that your idea is a good fit for their organization. Number two, you can ask them if it's not available on their website, um, how you can learn more about how grants are reviewed and how points are allocated within the grant. And they should either point you um, to a website or something if you haven't found it, or they should be able to tell you what that scope is. And it's a really good thing to do so you don't waste a lot of time and energy um, on it. Um, so you want to think about that and you want to know how many pages you can write for each section. All right. Now, one of the things that started happening, I'd say 10 or 12 years ago now, is that it's very rare for any funding organization to want to fund SAMO, SAMO. You know, they just don't. Everybody's looking for innovation. Um, they're looking for change. They're looking for that impact. And their assumption is you wouldn't be asking for money if you just wanted to replicate what you're already doing, unless getting that money to replicate it 
it's a really successful preliminary work. And with this extra money, you can spread it across the state or across your district or something like that. So it's, it's really important that you position what you want to do in a way that they can see what's cool about it. Okay. Is it original? Is it innovative? Um, does it challenge the existing status quo? Excuse me. Is there something about this, this funding that you couldn't do without the funding, that their funding is really going to create this positive impact and that you're being innovative enough that they're really willing to um, put their money um, there for you. Okay. So those are things that are very important to think about. And the other thing is significance. Are you addressing an important problem? Um, I personally think if you're on a SWAC team, you're addressing lots of important problems. I know that. But do they know that? Do you convey that what you're addressing is really critical? And again, back to what I said earlier, what's the advancement that's going to occur if they give you this money? right? And what is that impact? Remember, I asked you to write that down earlier? Well, there's a reason for that, because that's what they're looking for. And if you can't articulate it in your writing, then they aren't going to trust that you can deliver. That's a really thing, important thing. When you think about a grant in general, think about it as writing a persuasive argument. We've all been through those things where we've had to be persuasive in some way. We certainly have to be persuasive with the kids we work with, sometimes with our principals or whatever it is. Um, what you're doing with a grant is you're really creating a persuasive argument. So it's got to be strong and it has to really demonstrate that you know what you're doing and you can achieve this if you just had the money to do it. Okay. So the other thing that you have to do is explain things. You don't declare them. You don't say that if this funding is awarded, I'm going to change the world. Really good for you, right? How are you going to change the world? You really do have to explain things. The other thing, and it's so critical, is you should not assume that whoever is reviewing your proposal has the same background that you do. Often proposal review teams are made up of a constellation of people that may not even know much about disability or technology, or they may not know much about how schools work. It just depends on where you're applying, who you're going to get for a review. And um, so you can't assume that they understand what you're talking about. If you say early intervention, unless it's an early intervention funding organization, they may there may be people on the review panel that don't know that that's a discipline and it's a really important discipline and this is what it does. So you have to explain things. And then don't, don't use jargon, don't use acronyms and don't use buzzwords. The simpler the words are that you use in a proposal, the, you know, don't go for these polysyllabic words, you know, think about writing as simply and as clearly as you possibly can so that you're explaining exactly what you're going to do, how you're going to do it and why it matters. And those are really key things. Um, buzzwords are not appreciated. Okay. So you have to be not only innovative, but are you addressing maybe a new audience? Maybe there's a body of students that haven't been um, receiving services that, that this proposal would create that could be really cool. Is it something, a new way, new thing to try? And you have to be passionate, but at the same time, you have to be realistic. They appreciate, grant reviewers and funding agencies appreciate it when you say, this is what we can do, and this is where we are, and this is how this funding will take us to this next level, and this is what is very realistic. Because they, trust me, if you promise the world, they know you're not going to be able to deliver it, um, because you can't. 
So you have to be really clean and clear on what it is that you can actually do um, with these funding uh, elements. So be clear, be specific, be direct, and make it easy for others to give you what you want. Don't put up barriers to your reviewers. Does that make sense, I hope? Um, you really want to make it easy for them to see and visualize what it is you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, why it's important, and just answer their questions that are in the RFP, okay? So, I once did not interview someone because they, it was a doctor, a physician, and he sent me a resume that said he saw comma patients. And I figured if he couldn't get his resume right, I wouldn't want him around any of our clients, right? So simple things, grammar, spelling, and typos. And it's always a good thing to have someone read it. And we're going to talk a lot about this as we go forward, who should be helping you review your grant before you submit it. Um, but bottom line is you need somebody that's like a grammar, um, a grammar brain to review and read your document. You want to make sure all of those formatting rules are followed. You want to make sure your, your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted. Um, you really want all of that to be perfect because you lose points and confidence if you can't spell correctly in, or have your grammar correct, they don't trust that you can have other things correct. It's a very subliminal thing, but it's very powerful um, and something to think about. So solicit someone else because you've looked at it for 50, 60 hours at this point, maybe it's 100 hours. Your brain is not seeing what's on the paper anymore. So you want to make sure you have someone that has those grammar and editing skills. Um, I also want to talk about plagiarism. Um, you know that you don't accept plagiarism from your students, right? Grant reviewers, especially well-qualified grant reviewers, can pick up at a moment's notice if you've cut and pasted something from another document, because that's their expertise, right? So if you quote someone from a paper or whatever, put it in quotations, cite that you, you copied this from page six, um, Smith and Jones, 2021. It's okay to quote, it's not okay to plagiarize. And there's a big difference in this and they will pick up on it. So what I do, like if I'm writing a background section of a proposal and I'm, and let's say it's a research proposal and I want to talk about various um, research articles, I might literally cut and paste something into my document from a paper. But then what I do is I turn the text red on my screen and I immediately save it so that I know I have to go back and rewrite that section so that I'm not plagiarizing. And that's just something that I do um, for myself as I'm writing, because again, you get into this so deeply, sometimes you can forget. So think about strategies you can use to avoid these simple, simple mistakes that get made. Um, so again, going back to this approach, what is your approach? Okay. And what I mean by this is, let's say you want to, um, you want to develop a new um, educational program that's very inclusive of kids with disabilities who use assistive tech. Okay. The, the buzzword conceptual framework, in other words, what underlies this? Why is this important? What are you doing? Does your methods, is your program evaluation adequately developed and is it appropriate? So in other words, is the way you're going, the way you're conceptualizing this program and the methods you're going to use for say your teaching of this um, and then your evaluation metrics, how are you going to evaluate if you've been successful? Is it based on student pre and post scores? Is it based on um, 
Maybe it's helping children acquire literacy skills and improving them from point A to point B. How is it that you're measuring it? Are you measuring whether or not the people that are involved do the tasks that they said they were going to do for this proposal? How is it that you're going to measure that? And then have you acknowledged potential problem areas and considered alternative tactics? And for example, one that we use quite a bit for research studies is we know that re recruiting people with disabilities is tough. We know that from the get-go because we've done a lot of it. We also know that people with disabilities might have a higher attrition rate. They may drop out of a study at a higher rate than people without disabilities. We know that. It's been our experience, right? 30% of our clinic clients cancel on a weekly basis um, because of all the things that come up. And you guys know this from school as well. Okay, so go ahead and acknowledge that. Say it might be really difficult to get families to participate in this program because they do have a child with a disability and their lives are full. It's hard. We understand that. So what we're going to do if it happens that our number goes down, here's where, how we're going to address it. Here's how we're going to over recruit families to participate. So in case we have dropouts, we have we have enough people to participate or if something goes terribly wrong, like we all know COVID. As one horrendous example, we went from being in the classroom every day to not being there, and that necessitated a million different things. I mean, you can't predict everything that could go wrong, and you don't want to waste half your space writing about it. But you want the reviewers to know that you're a mature adult, that you've thought about this, you understand there might be some things that come up that you just are out of your control um, or that might come up that are within your control. And here are some alternative strategies or tactics that you're going to take in order to ensure that you're addressing these areas, these problems, should they arise. Because it's very important for the reviewers, again, you're building trust. You're writing this persuasive argument for why you should get to do this. And part of building trust is to say, you know what? Life isn't perfect. Things can go wrong, but I've got a backup plan for when they do. And here's what, how we're going to address this. Now, the next thing is personnel. And I will tell you, when I review a grant, the way I review any grant, whether it's a foundation, federal, state grant, what I do, first of all, is I read the, the project summary statement. Then I look at their budget and I want to see how much money is being asked for, how much is being allocated to people. And then I look at the, the, the resumes or the bio sketches or the curriculum vitas, whatever it's called within that agency. I look at the personnel. And one of the key things is, do you have the right people at the table? And so that means when you're applying for a proposal where you're going to be paying somebody some part of somebody's salary, are you going to have them involved in some way? If they're key personnel to this proposal, do they have the right training? Are they well suited to carry out this work? And that is, and if, if you have the wrong people at the table, you're not going to get funded. So you want to make sure you're addressing all of these little concerns. And is the work that you're proposing, is it appropriate to the experience level of the project director and the people that are involved? So, you know, you wouldn't say you're going to split an atom with people that have not don't have PhDs in physics and a whole bunch of other credentials behind their name, right? So you're not going to bring in a bunch of regular education teachers to do special education assistive technology. You might want a regular education teacher on your team, and that might be very instrumental. But at the same time, you want to make sure you have those other disciplines at the table as well, so that you're putting forward a very coherent and cohesive team for your proposal so that all of these little things really do make a difference. And then um, the environment, that is so important. Where is this gonna take place, right? Um, 
And does that contribute to the probability of success? And I'll give you an example right now, which by the way, we're recruiting young kids two to four with neuromotor disorders, um, upper limb impairment would be nice if you know anybody. But for example, one of my PhD students is building a robot that's a therapeutic augmentation tool to help augment what therapists do in the clinic when they go home. And so she's working at um, Sewell Child Development And rather than asking families to bring their kids to the medical school campus, she's out in the classroom because that environment is much more conducive for these kids participating, right? And because it has the accessibility built in and it's really a useful collaborative arrangement. And then the other thing is evidence of institutional support. What does that mean? That means that you're, whether it's a Maybe it's a district superintendent, maybe it is your principal, maybe it is your special ed um, director, whoever it is, they, they're at that institute where you work and they write typically write a letter or you write something in the grant that can be validated or verified by the funder that the institution supports you submitting this proposal and they're gonna help you. Institutional support can be matching funds it can be release time, it can be access to special tools or building spaces, whatever it is. You know, having them write a nice letter that, yeah, we think Jeannie's a wonderful teacher and she could, she's gonna do a great job. That is not institutional support. Institutional support is something very concrete. We are going to give her early release on Thursdays for four hours so that she can work on this project every week. We will provide meeting space. We will provide refreshments for families who come to this um, meeting or event that we're hosting for families. Whatever it is that you can concretely show that your institution, whether it's your building, your department, whatever it is, that they're going to put something on the table too. That's really invaluable. And that really tells the reviewers, again, building confidence in your project that you've got the backup of your team, of your leads, whoever your leads are. Um, And so that is um, a super important thing to do. Okay. And then let's talk about the sections of a grant. Every grant you write, you're going to have to do some kind of summary or abstract of your project. Um, This is usually what the public sees. Like if you go to a a foundation grant website or any grant website and they show projects that have been funded, this is what gets published on a website or this is what gets sent out to the public. So you always, always, always write your abstract or your summary after you finished writing the proposal. You don't do that first, you do that last, because then you can really summarize what your proposal is all about, okay? And then finally, I've given you all these rules like, you know, do this, do this, do this. You really have to convey excitement about your proposal. You know, you really want to say what we're doing is unique, it's different, it's cool, it's awesome, okay? And so, Be excited about your proposal, but again, be realistic. So it's a fine line in there that you want to convey. And so I want to talk, I've been talking a lot about the review process, the things that are really pertinent today. And one of the first big things is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, That is a very important thing to think about. And you can pretty much figure in today's world that applications are going to be reviewed to see if you're including genders, minorities, any subgroup as appropriate for the goals of the project. Okay. A good example is if you were doing a study with people with fragile X syndrome or a project with kids with fragile X syndrome, well, it hits boys at like four to one ratio. There's more boys with fragile X than girls. You would want to put that in your proposal that you expect a preponderance of males, but you'll do your best to balance the genders uh, while you're doing this. And you also want to make sure that you're thinking about collaborators and personnel. And are you looking at diversity, equity and inclusion there as well, if at all possible? That's um, 
something that is really being looked at and is important to consider in your proposal. Okay. The other thing, and I mentioned this a little bit, is the reasonableness of the proposed budget and duration in relation to the proposed project. And so to cut that cut to the chase, if you're applying for a project and you're applying for $20,000, what can you do for $20,000 realistically and in what time frame? You can't say you're going to save the world in 12 months with $20,000. You just can't. So you really have to be realistic about what you can do in that amount of time. And so that will be a key piece of your um, review. And then again, going back to what I already said, read the instructions. More grants get tossed out because people didn't pay attention to the instructions than for any other reason. It's really true. And again, never assume reviewers will know what you mean. You don't know that because you don't know who's reviewing your proposal. It's rare to know who's going to review your proposal. I've had that happen just a handful of times in all these years. So you have to really think about that and then refer to either the literature or the preliminary work. What has brought you to this point? Do it thoroughly. Make sure that you're showing because that's kind of showing your chops, if you will, and that you have the competence to do this or this kind of work has been done in the field already. And here's where there's a barrier or a problem with this work that you want to address. And what is your rationale? Why are you doing this? If the only reason you're doing it is to get money, to buy technology, that's not good enough, really. You know, you have to know what the rationale is for you going to this effort to write the proposal and why should they be willing to fund you, okay? And then if you're gonna include tables or figures or graphics of any kind, they really have to be well organized, well designed. They have to tell a story. You can cut a thousand words out of your document if you have a really good graphic table that shows what you're talking about. And if your page your pages are limited, I can write a 200 page proposal without any problem. When I'm limited to six pages like National Institutes of Health, it is really hard to tell a good coherent story that's persuadable in six pages. So that's where your tables and the other graphics you might choose to include can be really invaluable. If you're using a table or graphic that comes from somebody else, like from a paper you found, make sure you cite it correctly and that you give credit to the author who did the work um, because that will be no. And then you have to be all organized. Your, your write-up has to be very clear or lucid. Um, and then the thing that I do with every single proposal I write is I find what I call an ignorant reader. The definition of ignorant or ignorance is lacking knowledge. I find somebody who knows, usually my poor friends run from me at this stage, but I find people who know nothing about what I'm doing. And I ask them to read my proposal and then in their own words, tell me what I'm saying I'm going to do. That is the absolute best check because if they can't explain to you what you've written and what it means you're going to do, then you can bet your reviewers are not going to understand it either. And that's a great check to figure out where you've got problems with your writing and what you need to, to um, improve. And then take it back to them and say, does this make more sense? Get that feedback because it's so important um, to help you really get that money, okay? So let's talk about who might fund these big ideas you guys wrote down. There are a ton of people that will provide money to you. And I have to tell you, in the last four years, 
federal agencies like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, they have started putting disability in their strategic plans and technology for disability. That is the first time in my career I've ever seen that. So I'm pretty excited about that. What does that mean? What happens at the federal level tends to trickle down to the local levels, even into nonprofit foundations. So disability awareness is rising rapidly, as is the notion of using technology. In large part, COVID really taught the world about social isolation. And now people are starting to understand how people with who are not included in mainstream society, how detrimental that is. Likewise, with the aging, the baby boomers are getting old and all of a sudden we don't have enough money to take care of older adults. So how are we going to do it? Well, technology. And so all of that stuff, it's like this huge confluence has come together. And suddenly the work that we do, all of us do, is much more important than it was five or 10 years ago on, on a fundable level. So it's good timing for you guys to learn how to write proposals. Um, Foundations in Colorado, there's something called the Colorado Grant Watch that um, it's a website that you guys can, can look up. And on that website, it lists all kinds of funding agencies that are here in Colorado. Now, the other thing we have on our, our website for our Tech Act program, we have something called AT Funder. Um, and that's pretty much for individual clients. But if you go through, you can look through and find funding sources for assistive technology. Um, but that also might tell you where to look for foundations that might be interested in funding or where money's coming from in Colorado. So it can be kind of helpful that way too. At the state and um, at the state level, um, pay attention to what's going on in our state legislature. Oftentimes, there's funding that's set aside. For example, Governor Polis set aside money to increase preschools um, because these preschools are now getting lots and lots of kids with disabilities. We receive funding to help train, do professional development with preschools around Colorado as one example. So there can be money that's out there that maybe is that designated for schools that might be helpful for you to look for and to figure out how to go after it. Um, there are also federal grants. You're not gonna get a federal grant if you have a team of people that have never had any kind of funding. So the way to, if you're, if you're new to grant writing, you might wanna start out with some of these local small foundation grants. Um, we call them the animal clubs, the elks, the eagles, the lions. Um, you know, you might want to approach the Rotary Club or something like that in your local community and ask them, do you ever give out small grants, maybe $500, $1,000, $2,000? It's always good to build um, your on your success. You're not going to get a million dollar grant if you've never had a grant because it's just they're not going to trust that you can demonstrate, you can handle it. But if you can show you started by getting some of these smaller grants and you've built your way up, that's when you start getting the big grants. So titrate yourself. Think about who you are, where you are, what you can do and what your team can do, and then slowly begin to build up um, how you can get some of these, um, these grants. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. I know our time is getting short. All right. So when you write a proposal, it's very important to leave enough time before the deadline. So, for example, we had a proposal that was due January 5th. We made our deadline December 30th so that we had a few days to go back and recheck that checklist I showed you earlier, to go back and reread the RFP and make sure we hadn't left anything out, to make sure we uploaded it correctly. If they had, you know, in our case, we had one that you had to upload it into their granting agency stuff. So always set your deadline at least one or two weeks before it's officially due so that you have the luxury of time to go back and make sure you haven't missed a beat on that. It's very, very important. And you never know when the computers or the, you know, Xfinity is going to go out for the day. Um, how many, if you, we don't really make too many 
paper copies anymore. Sometimes you do, but if you have to have additional copies, if you have to get your boss to sign off on something, anything like that that you need, you want to make sure you've given yourself a window so that you can do that. I want to talk just briefly, and know we're almost out of time, about common pitfalls. Um, one of the things that you want to do when you remember at the very beginning, we were talking about your, your specific aims or your objectives. Make sure your objectives or your specific aims, depending on what they're called in your application, are in chronological order. You do step one before you do step through two, before you do step three. So make sure that you have all of that logically ordered. Because if you put your final thing first as your objective, they're not going to trust that you can do this. You want it chronologically ordered. And you can't assume that what you're proposing is going to work. And that goes back to what I said earlier about if there's a problem, what are you going to do and how are you going to fix it? So you want to acknowledge that. And then the other thing that drives reviewers crazy is if your figures are too small, um, if something's out of order or you duplicate the same sentence in your proposal in two different places, that drives reviewers nuts. Or if you've looked at something and you didn't describe it correctly, you've given the wrong interpretation, or just quite frankly, if all of these pieces and parts aren't feasible, because they'll pick up on that so fast. So you really want to make sure that what you're proposing is feasible and doable. Okay, and don't be boring. Um, you know, when you're just, you know, blah, 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 blah. Again, generating that excitement. Should this project prove successful, we will be changing the lives of 15 kids or 100 kids or 3,000 kids or whatever it is in this way. We can't wait to get started. You know, you want to exude that confidence and excitement that you really want to do this project. You know, you're not just there for looks. You're there because you mean business. Um, and then if you propose an old idea, and what I said is they don't want to, they don't want to fund that same old, same old, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the hour, they want to see something new, even if it's a tweak on something that's been in existence for a while. It's very rare to just continually get funding to do something that's already been done. That's not what they're in business to do. So you want to make sure that you're not giving an old idea. And that means getting out there, getting online, going through the literature, going through websites, whatever it takes to find out who's doing this idea in what way that's already out there. And what are you doing that's new and different and cool? You really want to do that. And the other thing is if your approach isn't the state of the art. You know, let's just say you say we need eight thousand dollars for copying because we're going to copy, you know, all these things. They don't really want to see that anymore. What they want to see is that this is paperless. It's online. It's cool. It's accessible. We can do it this way. Does that make sense? So you want to be sure that what you're doing really is state of the art. Now, just for grins, if you guys were looking at these two documents, which one would you want to read? Do you notice that the one on the right has white space? The, the lines are justified. And some, you have to look at the formatting requirements. Some people say don't uh, justify the lines. But if you look at the paper on the right, it is so much easier to read than the paper on the left. That is a subtle, cool thing you can do within your proposal that predisposes reviewers to like you. It's a very subtle subliminal thing. And there's actually research on this stuff, right? That says you want to make sure that you do leave white space. Even though your space is limited, you want to make sure that you're giving the reviewers eyes and brain a rest. And they're looking at something. If your paper is attractive, your project is more attractive. It's a silly little subliminal thing, but it's very powerful. So think about that as you're putting things together. Um, so yeah, you want the ugly one or the pretty one? You want to be pretty. Now, here's the thing. Turns out we don't always get funded. So if you are rejected, don't, well, maybe give yourself 24 hours to throw things, but then come back and you can always call the project officer for the competition that you were going after 
And you can very professionally and politely say, I understand we weren't funded and I, I really value and appreciate and thank you for the feedback you gave us already. Um, I'm calling you because I really want to do better. I'd like to resubmit this proposal if that's possible. And I'd like to know what I can do to improve. Ask why you were rejected and ask in a very kind and professional way. And you'll be amazed at how much help you'll get if you choose to resubmit, you know, the kind of information you can typically get from them. It's really rare that they won't share with you what happened, what went wrong. OK, the other thing you can do for many foundations, one of the best ways to learn how to write a grant is to volunteer to review grants. So if there's a local board in your community that you could maybe volunteer and ask to be a reviewer for their funding stream, you will learn so much sitting in those review uh, meetings. And I really do encourage you to consider that. And then here's the thing, when you submit a grant, don't, you know, like I said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Know that you're gonna try, you may fail that first time, and sometimes we've failed more than once, but you always wanna go back and continuously improve. It's that continuous quality improvement over and over and over again, so that you can be prepared to rewrite. And trust me, I always go back. I wait after I submit a grant, usually a couple days afterwards, I go back and reread it. Invariably, I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I see this before? I could have written this so much better. I could have done this. I could have done that. Take those notes. If you're not funded, read the critiques carefully. Address the reviewer's concerns and resubmit because that is your best strategy. And I know we're right up to the hour. Um, so um, if anyone has any quick questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. And um, just again, kudos to my team. They're amazing. And um, uh, I really appreciate being here too. Yeah. All right. So I am looking at the chat box real quick. Yeah, Robin, good point. It does help to find a grant that is a good fit. That's the number one prerequisite to even trying. And then Krista says, um, if your grant is denied, is there any value in returning to that grant again to submit the same request at a different time? Or is it likely to be denied every time? Should you only submit to a different funder? I kind of sort of address that. You really, every funding agency is different. Some of them will say it's a one and done because they only have the money now, they're only funding this one time, that's kind of rare. Usually, if what you're proposing fits their mission and vision for their funding organization, they want to see you reapply. They want you to make the improvements from the review and to get back on. Sometimes you find out after, even though you've read the website, you think it's a good fit, you've had a conversation, sometimes you get a review panel and they go right field or left field or whatever. And so um, uh, and so sometimes you do need to choose a different funder, but it's for that reason. Um, if it's a good fit, then you want to try to go back to the same one if they encourage you to do so. And that's why those phone calls are so important. So Aaron, um, is there a general length of time? Well, <laughs> that's the thing. I had one grant that I found out 18 months after I submitted it, it was funded. I got a phone call out of the blue and they said, congratulations, we're funding your grant. And I had no idea what they were talking about. It caught me so off guard. Usually you can read in the RFP. Sometimes they will tell you when grants awards will be announced. Sometimes they won't. And that's one of the questions it's fair to ask when you make your call to the project officer in advance. You can say it along the lines of, so I see that December 15th is your deadline for the applications. Can you give me a ballpark idea of when you might be able to review these and we'll get the word back one way or the other? And they'll usually tell you. But I've gotten funded within 48 hours and I've waited as long as 18 months to find out. So it's real important to look at the RFP, see if it says, look on the website. And then if you want to have that as one of your questions for a project officer, that's a good thing to do. Okay, so I hope I've answered the questions that were in the chat. Um, I am certainly available. Um, oh, one more. Let's see what we have. Oh, thank you. Um, you're very welcome. 
Um, so if there are any other questions, concerns, or comments, um, please feel free to reach out. I know our, our team here is happy to get things to me if you don't know how to reach me directly, but I'm kathy.bodine at cuanschutes.edu, um, and we'll do my best to uh, support you in any way that I can. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hopefully we got to hear a lot of SWAC member grant success stories in the future. It's really great the last, information. The last time I did this talk, two people got funded. Wow. And they emailed me later to tell me that they got funded because this is obviously, it's pretty straightforward common sense, but by paying attention to this and bringing it up to a level of importance, two people did get funded. So I was pretty excited about that. Awesome. Yeah, no, no pressure, Krista. <laughs> Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. All right. Thank you.